How are you, man? Good. Not bad. We're recording. Yeah, yeah, I took, yes, we are. I took a week off last week. Uh, man, it was good. I needed that. I went up to um, Lake Placid, which is up in the you know, Adirondacks, like mountains, uh, swimming in lakes, getting away. It was good. Oh, I really – I did the best. I haven't shut off the world for a long time, and this was – this was the first chance. It was good. Uh, I'm about to shut off the world yeah. in about two weeks. So I had planned to. I had this back operation done because, uh, and I could yeah. barely walk, and I was stuck. What did in you have life. done? Because I I had uh, some back operation in years. Micro discostomy. Yep. Welcome. Yeah. Which 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 disc was it? Uh, the lowest, the L5. Yep. Mine was L4, L5. Yeah, yeah. So you had sciatic pain for that? Dude, uh, never had so yeah, so, so much pain in my life. I, I, yeah. it, by the end of it, I, I couldn't even sit down. I was laying yeah. down. Yeah. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, I didn't realize you went through this. I had this yeah. same thing. Yeah. I couldn't sleep and, at night because I – I remember when they said to do the magnesium. I couldn't. I had to sleep on a sofa with my leg perched up on the edge of the sofa because for some reason if I had it flat, it would it pain was too much. Well, I had it to the point then when the drug stopped working. So I was taking yep. Uh, yep. like everything, yep. and it just stopped working. But then I went for the operation, and I woke up, mm-hmm. and I was instantly fine. Yep, me too, man. You got you guys have you and I had a parallel experience. You know, I remember just wanting to hug the doctor afterwards because I was just like, Jesus, you got it. But he said that in my case. It, like herniated discs are usually like it just it's it's just squishing out and, and touching mm-hmm. a nerve. In my case, like a bit of it had broken off and it just like lashed onto the nerve and was just like sitting on it basically. Oh. And 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 my so yeah, I was I couldn't I couldn't stand up straight. If I I had to if I straight it hurt, so I had to bend over all the time. I was like an old man, and I had it was like I was living in Argentina at the time, and I had flown from New York to Argentina. Uh, uh, on a you know just a trip back home, returning, and it, it's really interesting. It's, it to me, it's about how our diagnosis, and you can apply this to anything, right? Like it's all about what story is being told. And I was misdiagnosed, and I'm not entirely blaming the doctor. I am largely, but in some respects, I initiated it because the pain I was initially feeling was quite small, and it was down in my leg, right? It was like in the mm-hmm. it was at the edge underneath my knee. And I said, oh, yeah, I flew on this long flight and didn't sleep perfectly. It was an overnight flight. He goes, oh, it must be a pinched nerve. You must have sat there. And, da, 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 da. and he showed me the little nerve ending that was probably pinched and said, hey, go and take this, you know, whatever it was, uh, the, 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 nerve, the nerve killing pain and take some of that and you'll be fine. And I was like, all right, can I run? Yeah, yeah, exercise. That's a good idea. So I was running every morning uh, and it was warming up my legs and therefore the pain was going. And I just kept going and doing it every morning. But by the end of every evening, I was feeling worse. And I'd do it again. I was like, pain's getting worse. I better run again. So I'd run again. And then kept on. I was having MRIs on my leg. I was having all these. Well, here's the hell. There's no real problem. We don't know what it is. And eventually, my GP, who knew there was something seriously wrong with me, he laid me on a bed. And, and he said, all right, just lie down. And he grabbed my leg and pushed it up straight. And I went, fuck. And he goes, herniated disc and and that was it then they fixed everything oh, but like for man. ages i was making it worse and worse and worse yeah yeah so I, yeah I'm, I'm sharing your pain in the in the literal sense oh, there, peter mate honestly it's, it's the just, worst it's the worst well so i herniated it about a year ago and spoke to the doctor and the doctor was like just get back down the gym get exercise <laughs> yep. and i did and it fixed and yeah. i was fine and then i herniated it again and it never fixed yeah. and i couldn't i couldn't train i couldn't run i could swim a little and then I said, look, I, I need an MRI. I need to get this sorted. And then it, my health provider was messing me around. And then I got the call for yeah. El Salvador. So I was like, crap, I'll All go right. and deal with that. But I only had back yeah. pain. It was when yeah. I was after El Salvador, when I was in, I think uh, I was in Indianapolis after the 500. I just woke up one morning. Yeah. I was like, mm, there's a pain in my leg. I wonder what this is. Yeah. It's probably related. Yeah. But it was, it was really mild. By the time I got to Miami, I was like, I could barely move. So I got a, a epidural, which at the time Jesus. I thought was the right thing to do. Yeah, worst yeah, thing yeah. to do because then you think you're fine and so yep. i just like when it acted comes normal. off you're like fuck yeah, yeah. so yeah. by the time i got to that president interview i couldn't sit down which i told that story so i won't tell it again but basically oh, yeah, i just yeah. couldn't sit down so i got pumped full of drugs yeah. and then yeah. it got to the point where by every everywhere i was traveling i was having to lay down on back seats because i couldn't yeah. sit down anywhere yeah. and yeah. the drugs then stopped working and then i got to the point of tears <laughs> And yeah. then had the operation, no, but the, opera- the operation is a miracle. It's so funny because anesthetic's so weird. Like we were talking about sleep earlier 
when you're yeah. asleep, you drift in and out. You kind of know you're sleeping all night. Yeah. But when oh, you yeah, have an yeah. anesthetic, yeah, you yeah, close your yeah. eyes you and then I you have... open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I know. You're I, like, I, it's so funny. I have a very similar story. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. What was your case? And what can you, can you, because I had like, to me, it's like the break in reality. Like, on that particular, like, I've actually had a couple of anesthetics, but this was when I had my back done. I remember I was like chatting to the nurse and she was saying to me, Oh, you know, you speak pretty good Spanish, you know, and I, um, do you speak Portuguese? You must have been Brazilian. And I was like, oh, I don't really, you know, I can, I can get by something like that. Blah, 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 blah. And, I, and I said, I speak a bit of what like they call it Portuñol, but I didn't get around to saying that. And then I remember like coming and continuing the conversation. So yeah, I can do a bit of Portuñol, blah, 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 blah. And like, uh, she's not there and there's somebody else looking at me like what the fuck are you talking about like you know it's like you know and i was like you're not her no you've had your operation dude <laughs> you know, like it's, in, it's like this bizarre it is you have no consciousness of being asleep or out of it it just it starts and then it it finishes yeah it's amazing well the the last one i had was a kid and i so i remember them yeah. telling me to count it down but i don't remember the yep. whole thing and yeah. uh the anesthesiologist is that what they call it uh, no mm -hmm. anesthetist mm -hmm. tanker me and no, he's like, he's yours, that's what they call him here. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, yeah, he came out and he was talking to me before the op. And he, and he started looking at my neck. He was like, measuring, my, like, grab my neck. I was like, mm. what's that? He's like, well, it's for the breathing tube. I was like, what do you mean the breathing tube? He's like, well, mm. when you have an anesthetic, like, everything stops. You mm. stop breathing. I was like, mm. well, nobody told me this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? He's like, yeah, we have to intubate you. I'm like, okay, this is new. And yeah. he was like, well, you've just got to deal with it. So, anyway, I was going into the room, like, ready to do my countdown. And I'm laying there, and they start putting stuff in, like the um, uh, into the like tube into my wrist, mm -hmm. and then I'm gone. And I feel a tingle, then I'm gone, and I didn't yeah. even know it. And then I it, then I wake up like that. Yeah, no. and I and I wake up, and I'm just like laying there, and then I'm lot, and then I drift off back to sleep, and I wake up. Mm -hmm. I was like, I feel great. Um, I feel good. Like, and I was like mm -hmm. feeling. I was like, I can feel everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just probably should tell us on the podcast, but that felt like my balls. I couldn't feel my balls. Oh, like, why, why am I numb here? But like everything else is fine. So, so yeah. I panic and I get up Google and I search and there's like this whole thing about uh, uh, people who have a, um, a microdiscotomy who are then yeah. uh, uh, like basically oh, can't have paralyzed. sex afterwards. No, 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 oh, no. They have, no. They have like sex. erectile Literally, dysfunction. Yeah. Uh, oh, and I was like, what the fuck? So anyway, I try to get the doctor. The nurse comes in. She's like, "What's the problem?" I was like, "Can I speak to the doctor?" She said, "No, he's busy." And she's like, "What's the problem?" I was like, "I can't tell you." I can't. Anyway, oh, no. she eventually got him in. He was like, "No, no." He said, "Can you feel your ass?" I was like, "Oh no." So that was like yeah. the last place for the numbness to go. But oh, I couldn't the numbness stand is still going. Jesus, yeah. yeah, you had to panic. Wow. But it's dude, amazing. honestly, it's a miracle. Since then, yeah. like everything is back. Yeah. Life is back to normal. This has happened pretty quickly compared because I saw you when you were. I, uh, yeah, I, I know you had your interview. I didn't realize you were doing it. Uh, I didn't think I watched it or anything, but uh, you were lying. You had all these issues with it, but wow. Yeah, dude, I yeah, was yeah. So, jacked up on the drugs. Cause, yeah, because you saw me just – we had, um, we had yeah. a couple of cheeky gins in New York before I headed out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and you were, you were probably just getting by on the uh, on the drugs at that point or something, right? Or an epidural. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I had the epidural, and yeah. but I was fine. It was when yeah. I got to El Salvador, the pains came back. But it was literally yeah. the morning of the interview. I got up, went to get a coffee, and I went to sit down. And I was like, I can't yeah. fucking sit down. <laughs> what? <Jesus. laughs> Today no, of all really days. Is. Yeah, and I know. I, know, I absolutely know it. It was, it was horrible. All righty. So uh, yeah, listen, the, yeah. Beginning of, the beginning of the podcast, we've talked about uh, erectile dysfunction and <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, – <laughs> <laughs> and, and, yeah. back page <laughs> midlife cocktails. crises with yeah. back page. yeah okay, exactly yeah. all right talk about ex-wives next if we want i don't know if you've got any of those no, no, no. i don't have <laughs> any exes shit. but uh, i've got uh, right, yeah, we'll go there right. we had a good chat in new york uh, and it's left me for a while um mm -hmm. what we spoke about and i think it's a really interesting subject this whole the the new battle that and, and, and like i always trying to bring things back on a personal level but i've been wrestling with politics now for a good four or five years i've i've felt myself in bitcoin go from from what would be seen in america as from left to right what in the uk is from right to almost libertarian <laughs> it's different where you are in the world yeah uh, yeah the words liberal means something completely different on either side of the atlantic yeah completely different i am now uh completely disenfranchised with all politics but <laughs> but but struggling to see a world without some form of centralized government 
or mm. governance, let's let's say. And yeah, I know other yeah. people are like, well, you've not tried it. I had the interview with Michael Malice, and you know, I definitely like a lot of what the things the anarchists talk about and the libertarians talk about. But I'm really disenfranchised with politics, especially during this time of COVID. Uh, uh, everything just seems completely crazy. So the conversation we had and the conversation we're going to have today, I think, is useful for me and i think for other people but i just i just before we get in just so people know who you are because like i know who you are i know about the book you wrote with paul and i know obviously that you work over at coindesk but do you want to just give people a bit of an intro so they they are aware of you yeah okay um uh, hi, hi everyone michael casey uh i am the currently the chief content officer at coindesk uh and continue to be for a while by the way there i didn't mean to, to layer a qualifier on that for any other reason other than i haven't been there that long before that i was um, I was at MIT for a little while as part of the Digital Currency Initiative, but most of my life I've been a journalist. And so I was uh, at Dow Jones and the Wall Street Journal for a bunch of years, lived all over the world, did different things as correspondents and so forth, and uh, basically covered global finance and economics and, and things and stumbled into Bitcoin in 19, 1913, 2013, uh, and wrote uh, a book with the, the first book of a couple we've written this with with Paul Vigna, the age of cryptocurrency. He wrote another one called The Truth Machine, more about blockchain technologies and and so forth. So yeah, I'm a I'm a author. Uh, I run uh, the content side of things at CoinDesk. Um, you know, I do a podcast, write a, a a weekly newsletter called Money Reimagined Podcast with Sheila Warren of the World Economic Forum. Same thing once a week. Uh, I manage a grow rapidly growing team of journalists and and multimedia people and researchers and so forth at the uh, most important media platform. Uh, for the crypto economy in the world, CoinDesk. There you go. How's that? Oh, well, I would debate you on that last point. I thought you might, but I'm just have to plug it. Then. Sorry, <laughs> no, I'll, I'll take Bitcoin. You can take uh, crypto. We'll we'll leave it there. We won't we won't have that. Oh fight. yes, there, we won't go that one. That's a different we, conversation. We, yes. we won't go down the board. Look, this this conversation is really interesting because one of the most interesting things I've observed with politics, and I've seen it less in this country. I, I find it more of, of an observer of the US just because I think I'm on the outside of how Mm. these battle lines on specific issues are drawn. And it's like, okay, if you're on the left, we're black. If you're on the right, we're white. And and whatever the issue is, people seem to be drawn into their camp. They seem to be drawn into their political camp. But I heard this really, I think it was on Rogan the other day, where someone was talking about it. It was something like the uh, the 80% silent, uh, exhausted majority. majority oh, okay. is a, yeah, exhausted yeah. majority. That's so nice. the majority of the fight is between like ten percent on each side, and everyone else is just exhausted by it all. And I think the Trump era, uh, mm-hmm. and I don't blame this isn't to blame Trump, but it's more to blame the media. But the Trump era created this this character who was great for TV, but it pitched pitched two sides against each other like I've not even seen before. I mean, you, you might have seen it differently. Maybe it's my age, but I just... I'm, I'm older than you, I think, Peter, but so yes. Just a I, couple, I, I couple of years. Yeah. <laughs> but we seem to be in this new era of just like crazy politics now, like even crazier than I've mm. ever known. And it is leaking here in the UK. It is happening here as well. And we're seeing demonstrations globally. We're seeing revolutions. We're seeing... Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's just like a really crazy time right now. So I think it's it is a good time to have this conversation of centralization versus decentralization. I've got like my own thoughts on it, but mm-hmm. it's something you focused on. You've been tweeting some ideas. Do you want to do you want to give a idea of your kind of thesis? So I think the tweet you focused on was was my uh, idea that basically you know Bitcoin itself is 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 something that sort of is challenging the the traditional left right divide. But before we go into that, um, I, I think like the heart of the problem is um, has, has a lot to do with this centralization decentralization problem, specifically as it pertains to the internet and social media. So I wrote a book uh, uh, with a guy called Oliver Luckett, who is a, a social media entrepreneur, called The Social Organism. And it's it was all about social media and how it is this sort of completely radical new system of information exchange, right? Like, And it's, it, it shows the history of it, right? We went from these very centralized systems, right? The church was the basically arbiter of facts at one point, and there was the only guy in the town who could read was the priest, and he imparted the knowledge from all the way down. And then eventually you moved to, you know, books, you know, the Gutenberg Press came out, everybody could read, but you still kind of had a, a control of the, of the printing presses. And then you end up with, you know, 
television and things like that with you know the broadcast tower being the kind of the almost like the the, the steeple of the church and Walter Cronkite imparting his knowledge you know and we basically broke it down and down and down and eventually we got to the point where the internet let everybody have a voice right and that is a decentralized architecture. The whole point about the internet was that it was decentralized. So we're starting with this issue whereby we have a new information system that is completely decentralized. And what that meant is the Overton window, which is a word that was a phrase that, that was, was popular in the 60s, and then sort of nobody talked about it. Now everyone is talking about the Overton, Overton window. And the Overton window has widened. And so it used to be that the, the Walter Cronkites, if you like, the, 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 the People who owned the distribution mechanism, which was a very expensive thing to own, if you were a, you know a monopoly media company, you had to pay a lot of money to build a television system or, or build the printing presses. Um, you basically used that power to sort of dictate who had a voice, and basically, if you were um, of the extreme right. You know, you were a Ku Klux Klan, white supremacist. You really didn't get a look in. You weren't listened to. If you were a radical Che Guevara-loving uh, Marxist, and by the way, if, if I was around, I would have been able to show you some of my Che Guevara paraphernalia because I wrote a book about Che. Uh, oh, anyway, uh, but it was, it, was more of, it was about the image and the, and the cult and everything else, and it was about capitalism and how really it turned Che into what it is. But anyway, those two extremes could not really make it into, certainly into American public discourse because the controllers of the media uh, uh, said so. Now we've blown the whole damn thing open, right? So we have this decentralized system for information exchange. Everyone has a voice. But you know what hasn't changed? The actual centralized systems of government, uh, as well as the centralized control of not only regular companies, but of the internet itself, right? So we have Facebook and Twitter as these captured powerful monopolies a very centralized architecture but we have this decentralized mechanism for actually you know taking in information so these two things are clashing because there's there's just no way for us in this world to make sense as we used to we need our brains are pretty limited peter i mean mm -hmm. i hate to say it yours is you know maybe a few times more powerful than mine but ultimately when you've got this barrage of everything coming at you you need something to make sense of it which is why we have you know our feeds and why we actually just, just choose to watch something and not others but if you've got algorithms that are actually working with this emotional aspect of what you do and by the way this was the other part of the social organism it was all about using this biological metaphor to describe how information flows in this environment in that it is similar to the way that you know biological functions happen evolution also the spread of of genes or the, the the spread of disease viruses all these sorts of things and ultimately memes and things function in this way it is a uh it is a mechanism by which these nodes come together and spread information but but you can monkey with that right it's our emotional responses that actually triggers how we what we like what we share what we retweet and so forth and algorithms as we all know now know ca surveillance capitalism by the way the best book that, that that tells us how terrible this stuff is is essentially designed to manipulate us to do these things so we're all kind of losing our free will because the algorithms are telling us here's what you want to look at here's what you don't and in this environment where anybody can say anything, it all feeds into this, this other form of filtering, which is an algorithmic control through the corporate entities that control the platforms. So that's the biggest problem in the world right now, not whether or not you, know, you, you think that uh, you know, we should have uh, an 80% tax rate or a 20% tax rate. It is that essentially our information system is supposed to be decentralized, right? Which could have been a good thing if we would allow it to naturally form our new mechanisms for governance, but instead is controlled by these entities. And this is where Bitcoin, and I'm going to say blockchain as well, because I do think that these, these systems dun, dun, actually dun. Give, us, give us a chance to think about how we would structure governance, which is a word you use, which is exactly the right word, uh, in this environment where we're breaking down naturally all these corporate these corporate and by the way I mean centralized structures including including government control so it's a it's a completely uh, disorientating state of affairs and it starts it starts with the internet it, it really does um, and I don't think really people quite understand how utterly completely phenomenally transformative the internet was to how we actually as a society, come together and figure out ideas.
Well, mate, uh, half the people who listen to this, or maybe half, maybe maybe a bit less, won't have known a time of no internet. They just don't That's know. That's right. It, which yeah. is a weird thing but, to but, talk about. But they also are fed the ideas that you're supposed to be able to, like that they don't recognize that this is the internet. They don't understand the architecture underneath it. It's feeding all this stuff. They're still accepting what the algorithm's tell, telling them as if they think they're in control, but they're not, right? So it's it's the matrix. <laughs> it's truly the matrix. Do you know what? Sometimes I, I wonder if I, I think I had a happier childhood than my kids do in some ways because they didn't have, because we didn't have the internet. Yeah. There was no internet. I, I think the same. But there was no, like, I, I've, I've got a constant argument with my daughter about Instagram at the moment. She wants it, and I'm just not allowing her to have it. Um, I watched the Rogan interview with, uh, is it Jonathan Haidt, where they talked about the increase in uh, teen depression and self-harm mm. because of Instagram, because you've got kids who are uh, seeing these images of these beautiful people, which are essentially using a- algorithms to filter themselves mm-hmm. um, and the pressures that puts on them. So I'm, I sometimes, I think I, I had a happy childhood. It was mostly mm. outside. Um, mm. Pretty much we would just go out and do what we wanted and run around the fields yep. and start little wars and things like that. And it was great. And, <laughs> and, and, and yeah, my kids are doing similar, but online. So headsets on in their bedrooms yep. and stuff like that. And people will say, well, you're bad parenting, but it's just a different time. And you, you, you try and drag them away from it, but they still want to be back there in the virtual world. They want to ready play a one world. So I, I yeah. think a lot about that, but I'm also thinking a lot about social media about the algorithms, about how how the algorithms incentivize your own behavior. They drive your own thinking. I actually deleted Twitter off my phone today. Um, wow. Yeah. You, no more Peter McCormick on Twitter. No, no, no. I'm, t- I'm on Twitter just off my phone. Oh, just off your I phone. Just, oh, got it. Sorry, sorry. That was, that was an extreme move. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Because you yeah, look at, I, yeah. I was looking at how much screen time yeah. I'm on Twitter and I'm just using it. I'm, I'm no, saying Twitter's it's work a, as an Twitter's excuse. A, but yeah. sitting there arguing with people who've got like 20 followers and no disrespect for their number of followers, but like, why am I wasting yeah. my time? With no, this? I, I've stopped arguing. That's why I, and people, people look at me like, why aren't you responding? I'm like, just cause I don't want to go there. It's just, well, it's, yeah. it's, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm part of the 80% exhausted. That's, that's the point. I just, it's yeah. too exhausting to engage. Right. And that's, and that's actually not healthy because I do think that if we were to do this, right. If, if there were to be, First of all, education. Like if we all understood what was going on, B, there were not these algorithms manipulating us, and C, you know, we had uh, essentially uh, a, a government that understood this because we do need our governments. Um, you know, we we might actually find that this whole social media structure is a really conducive way for us to sort of develop a society. I, I will. I tend to agree with you on the kids because, you know, I, I just can't help think the same. I had a very similar childhood, lived in Australia, surfed, rode bikes, played footy, played cricket, you know, that was it. Um, but then, you know, when I, um, I look at my kids, yes, phones, whatever. However, one of my daughters, um, is gender fluid, right? And, and, uh, I remember thinking when she came out like, oh my God, she's going to get teased. It's going to be horrible. How is she going to live with this? She's going to have no friends, blah, blah, blah. You know, cause that's what my childhood was. If you were that different, you were completely ostracized. Mm. But because of the internet, she's had connections that she's made all around the world and she's mm-hmm. built this sense of identity. She's an artist. She's going to the School of Visual Arts, does animation. She's a brilliant, smart, clever kid who has built a sense of self and community, I think, very much because the internet gave her something that she didn't have. So there's various ways to skin this mm, cat. Exactly. Um, but it's just, you know, we we have a structure that doesn't work. I definitely think our politics is completely and utterly broken as a result of this. Well, there's each evolutionary steps to this. Um, there was an incentives for companies to build these structures, and we've created billionaires out of them. Um, mm. But it has become concerning over the last. It's, I think it really feels like again. I, I heart back to the Trump era, but seeing a president deplatformed was yeah. a really kind of like it was a really weird moment in time. Um, mm-hmm. to, to see that you could actually take a president of the United States, the most powerful man in the world essentially and you could remove him from facebook and twitter you could remove his voice and that that was a moment that i kind of i at the time i treated like a joke like it was almost funny that this could happen but then i had a conversation with david bailey about it and i was like you know what you because he was really upset by it. he came off twitter because of it and i thought you know what he really has he really had a point and perhaps it's just these evolutionary steps before we get into that i just want to pick you up on one point because it's a really important point uh, to discuss, especially amongst a Bitcoin crowd, because you say we do need governments. I talk about that sometimes, and I get mm-hmm. 
viciously attacked as a cock mm. and status and yada yada. I'm looking forward to the the, the, the <laughs> looking forward to all the sort of a Twitter attacks that I'm going to get now. Then, um, look, well, I think I think we need governments largely because of where we are right now in this transitional phase. Like, mm. but and, and by the way, this transitional phase is not something that's going to be over and done with in you you or my lifetime. Mm. I do think that yeah, ultimately they are an anachronistic concept. I think more importantly, the nation state is a completely anachronistic concept. I mean, like the hell, I know that you've been interested in the plight of refugees and so forth. Mm. And like, it, it is, and I, you know, I'm, a, I'm an immigrant here. This is accent. There's not an American accent. Grew up in a, you know, but, but you know, fell in love with an American, totally felt like the borders completely constrained. And now, by the way, right now, I can't visit my dad who is suffering from Alzheimer's because Australia has this fortress rule, even though I'm an Aussie, right? So, so the control of our, of our international environment by these arbitrary things, you know, Benedict Anderson's imagined communities concept, all of this is an anachronistic concept. But government or governance, whatever you want to call it, has to be there. We, need, we, we, we can't, like, I'm not a hardcore libertarian by any stretch. I, like, you just literally impossible to go off and not have some form of rules system by which you interact with others because all of our well-being and wealth really comes from that certainly in this age it might have been different in the nomadic era when you could go off and kill your own you know beast and eat it but every aspect of where our prosperity comes from is a function of our interaction with somebody else right it need you need rules for that you can't possibly engage without rules now how do we actually govern those rules is the question. That's, again, where, where Bitcoin and blockchain is really interesting because it gives us a framework. I think libertarians tend to focus too much on the outcome of, of, of a blockchain structure of Bitcoin. They, oh, I've got this thing, this asset, and so leave me alone. What's really most interesting to me, at least, as somebody who's sort of studied political economy most of my life, is and why I was drawn into Bitcoin. Because, oh my God, this was a system that without anybody in control gave us a bunch of rules that we were all agreeing to and it would therefore allow us to do what we really want to do, which is interact with each other. I can exchange with you. And even though I don't know you, which is the power of a government in the first place, is allowing all these disparate imagined communities to form as if they know each other and can talk to each other and trust each other, can now do it regardless of any sense of who you actually are or where you are in the world. So it is the first step to breaking down the nation state, which I think is a good thing. But my God, we have a long way to go because so much of the world is still dependent upon these systems. Um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a pipe dream to imagine that we could just do away with government altogether and we'd all happily uh, treat each other with love and affection and, and we'd magically all discover these rules. You know, I mean, aspects of this are there like culture itself is a rule system it is a protocol uh language is a protocol these things evolved um and and they are mechanisms by which you know the way we say please and thank you and we all agree to line up in a queue and so for some of this is automatic kind of agreed upon rules but um we also know that like human greed is is just a powerful force and um it will you know it, it, it the, there's 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 it this is not new <laughs> this is the story of humanity so i just don't I, I we need governments right now absolutely yeah how we evolve them into a new form of governance is the is is the big question immigration is a, it's a really interesting issue um i went out to turkey just before the covid lockdown when the border crisis with greece started blowing up and i smuggled myself into this camp that just popped up out of nowhere just right at the border crossing because the Greeks yeah, weren't letting them in. Yeah. yeah, they built up the barbed wire fences and people, basically all these people from different communities were, it was almost like a festival. They were just building tents and structures. There was uh, humanitarian aid coming in and I just went around talking to people and they're from everywhere, Eritrea, Afghanistan, Syria, they're all different places. And obviously there's been a lot of issues in Greece and I understand uh, uh, what some of the complaints are about. But I'm very sympathetic to immigration because uh, talking to these people and understanding their plights, uh, uh, their situation is no different to mine. If I want to move to the US, which I've always talked about wanting to do, it's because economic, I want to go for economic opportunity because that's where I think my business will be best based. And it didn't matter who I talked to, whether they're from Eritrea or Syria. I mean, some are escaping war. Yeah, some were uh, escaping oppression, but most of them is just about economic ep opportunity. So I came to this kind of position that I felt like uh, immigration is really a, a racial and a class issue because 
uh, you, I, as you know, white, first world, Australian, English people, we can uh, mm -hmm. move to other countries and nobody really gives a shit. I think it becomes more of an issue where uh, people are coming from poorer countries and they need a leg up perhaps when they get to the country to work. And I think it also, for many, who won't admit, it's a, it is just a plain and simple race issue. But um, I, I as, I'm very sympathetic on the immigration issue. I know it's complex. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I am sure it's very complex in the US on the Mexican border with people coming up mm -hmm. from South Central America. I don't know the answer. But I'm sympathetic to every person who wants to move to another country to better their life, and I'm and most I, I get really disappointed with some of the arguments I hear against it because they're usually coming from someone with a from a position of privilege. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it is one of those like the, the, the gene lottery, right? You happen to yeah. be lucky enough to be born a certain color in a certain place, and and in our current, you know post-Westphalian world, which we've had the last 400 years of these nation-state concepts, you happen to have been bored within the boundaries of this arbitrary line that was built around these things, right? And I have nothing, you know, I have so much more in common with, say, an Indian who loves cricket um, and is maybe into tech and, and so forth than I do have with many of my immediate neighbors. And yet, I'm supposed to be aligned with them around some nebulous concept of national identity, even though I'm an immigrant who came in here as an Aussie, uh, you know, and I do actually have U.S. citizenship because for a bunch of reasons I can go into that. But, um, you know, these, this, is, this, is, this is part of the problem, and that's why, to your point, and I agree with you 100%, it is just uh, unfair. Like, it's an un – it is just – and so how do we deal with that? And, and the thing is, like, it, again, this comes down to you – know, immigration is itself, I think, a – uh, and the problems we have with it now are an outcome again of this of this you know this clash between the decentralization of our information system. You can talk to anybody, anybody in El Salvador, and we can talk about why El Salvador and the, the Mexican border mm. is a really interesting issue right now with regard to Bitcoin. Um, you know, anybody in El Salvador can look and see what is happening right now in the United States, what they can get, what they can't, and so forth, right? We live as if we almost can touch in an unreal sense the lives of others, the experience, but our physical experience is completely different. So we're allowed to sort of imagine an, a, a relationship with everybody, and that has never been made more and more as possible as, as it is now through this technology. But at the same time, the same old centralized arbitrary structures about where we can and can't live are are there right so these two things are just creating a clash as is as i would say is and will climate change you know these things are going to really push these things out the answer if we want to talk about immigration to me and it's not like a revelation but it is how do we invest in systems that you know allow for domestic prosperity in these places um and let because we, you know, regardless of whether you know, and I again agree with you. I don't. I think these borders and rules and controls are just fundamentally unfair. But we just literally can't have everybody living in the United States or or, or in in the UK. Um, what we need, of course, is opportunities everywhere in the world, um, and and to breed systems that actually self generate that sense of prosperity and, and welcome. Which is why the you know the El Salvador uh, experiment is so interesting. I'm I'm, mm. I'm on the fence as to whether or not it's going to go the right way. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on on it. But um, the I do I do think that if I were to be you know, if I was the US president, uh, I would be looking at what they're trying to do with Bitcoin and thinking, okay, how do I make that project uh, jet move in the direction that I want it to be rather than the direction, direction that it shouldn't be precisely because El Salvador is, I think, either first or second in the biggest sending nation for uh, immigrants crossing the border, right? So yeah. there's a whole lot of, this stuff comes full circle in a, quite an interesting way when you mm. think about you know, immigration and Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, I'm wholly wrapped up in the El Salvador project now, uh, yeah, traveling right. back and forth. Uh, love the mm. country, firstly. I just love the country. I love mm. the people. I've been treated so well there uh, every single time. It's, it isn't the country you're led to believe it is. Um, mm. I always, I mean, the first time I went, I was getting off the plane nervous because they said, you know, don't get any money out at the airport. People will be following you from the airport. None of that was it. I mean, maybe historically has happened, but I tend to find our – uh, government advice websites tell you the most fearful version of visiting a, a country and then when you search for el salvador you hear about the gangs 18th street you see you go into uh, the documentary channels and it's world's worst prison it'll be like one of them will be el salvador and <clears throat> so you have this belief that it's like you're going to get off the plane and you're going to walk into 
gang country. And it's going to be guys covered in tattoos and you know, white T-shirts and long socks. And, hey, I see. Like all that stuff, all that kind of cliche. And I haven't seen any of it. It just doesn't exist. It's a beautiful country. And like most places in the world, you have to travel with a bit of common sense. But I feel perfectly safe there, happy to take my kids. But the project itself, to me, is super important on the uh, because it's so tied to the success of Bitcoin. Um, mm. If Bitcoin is a successful project over the next, say, let's just say, just keep it short term, next decade, it will be it will be infinitely more successful for El Salvador because it will, it will raise up the the uh, opportunity investment into the country because it's just a few things if you have to think about that they have a deflationary, well, let's say they have the US dollar, which is a currency that's being debased, um, and they have Bitcoin now. And for everybody who wants to go into the country and have residency, it's cost three Bitcoin of an investment. So that puts three Bitcoin into the country. Every single major company exchange bitcoin companies also looking to invest in the country you don't have to go on twitter now every bitcoin has been there is going there and when they're going there they're leaving dollars but they're leaving sats and so my very simple thesis on el salvador is if over the next you know year two three years there's a huge injection of bitcoin into the country if bitcoin continues to do as it does it's going to accelerate the gdp growth of the country it's going to just naturally become a more wealthy country and that's going to be that's going to be really interesting because that's going to be something other countries can look at as an example of how you can invest in a country. Not so much. It's not just just about the Bitcoin and Bitcoin going on, you know, ball runs. But it's showing how you can invest in a country, how people can go and live in a country like that, work from there. They can establish themselves, yet they don't have to worry about currency. So I think there's so many interesting parts of that El Salvador project that I am almost fearful as well that that it doesn't work. Mm. Like, yeah. what are the implications of that as well? Well, can I just hit hit, hit on that? Because, <clears throat> look, I think it's absolutely fascinating. I think it really does. It's 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 basically pregnant with possibility. I mean, this could be, to your point, something that just transforms uh, development as as a concept and the role that, that that sort of Bitcoin could play in this. My concern is not that it won't generate GDP. I tend to think that Bitcoin's price is going to rise and therefore that there will be in this idea of like, the three Bitcoin coming in is, is every time someone arrives is going to play into that and so forth. My, my concern is how well the wealth of it's going to be distributed, right? And this isn't to come at a game. This, this, this whole conversation is about left and right. This is really about centralized control. And my concern is that they haven't yet built a model by which the most immediate sort of on the ground, uh, almost like real estate grab of this Bitcoin isn't going to be in the hands of the powerful. And I don't just mean the government, and this isn't to pass judgment of Bukele otherwise. I know he's a problematic, controversial figure, but it's it's really about the structures they put in place and the, the state on the ground of the villages, right? So it is a big gang place, and I'm sure you were treated beautifully, but like MS-13 mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. truly there, and they have relationships in these villages and so forth, right? So how do you keep the Bitcoin out of their hands mm-hmm. and, and, and also, by the way, out of the hands of corrupt state bodies like I, 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 and, and get it spread amongst the people? So... The Lightning app is fantastic. Strike is going to be useful. All of that stuff's great. But um, you really want to have a way to auto-generate self-power in this situation. And I, what I worry about is that I, the volcano thing set me off because I was like, come on, dudes. This is not like it, – it's kind of sexy, right? You know, volcano money. But that's a state-run geothermal plant. All of that Bitcoin is going to go into the hands of the state coffers. Will they distribute it through some sort of magnanimous, you know, altruistic tax uh, or, 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 you know, welfare distribution system? Maybe that'd be great. But I think what they what really needs to be happen are uh, sort of models for auto generation of Bitcoin wealth. I, I could talk for till the cows come home about it, but decentralized solar microgrids structures in these. Uh, uh, you know these neighborhoods that give them f- free or very very cheap power and a mechanism for actually sort of funding that through sort of Bitcoin mining that then is fed amongst these communities and sort of decentralized autonomous structures, allowing these folks to actually not just you know use it for for commerce but have an income from this at that village level. If you can build a structure like that, then you've got an absolutely mind blowing change in terms of direct direction of development. And here's why. I think we still need to be cautious. It's called the curse of OPEC, right? Mm-hmm. Nigeria is resource rich, um, but you know it's a screw up, mm-hmm. right? It mm-hmm. is, it is a screw up, and 
Oil is not distributed well. We're Venezuela, right? Venezuela is an even yeah. better example. You could use an analogy with Bitcoin in this context. It's not perfect, and by, mo- by no means is this to sort of disparage Bitcoin as a thing. But the idea of centralizing the mining of Bitcoin around, you know, like an all-powerful single state-owned concept where all that mine, all of that Bitcoin is now going to the hands of one entity, essentially. That is part of a problem that you've seen repeated over and over again across all of the OPEC countries. Norway is the only OPEC country that, you know, obviously Middle Eastern countries are pretty wealthy and prosper- prosperous, but as, a, as functioning societies, I wouldn't necessarily want to, want to live in them. Um, well, you know, uh, and the they, rest uh, of them are all complete basket cases when, it, you know, they're, they're, they're failed states, basically. So you have that as an as a unfortunate precedent. And I, again, I think that the rest of us in the Western world should be out there helping El Salvador get the structure right so that, so that Bitcoin and, you know, decentralized technologies develop in that part of the world in a much more distributed, evenly uh, opportunity for everybody kind of model. The, the Venezuelan model, let, let's talk about that for a moment. Um, because as you said, it's an oil rich country, the richest country in South America at one point. Um when uh, oil was $120 a barrel and Chavez was in power, you know, he, he, yes, he was a socialist, but he did want to redistribute the wealth. Um, it was his biggest mistake rather than it was essentially creating, um, I think, was it one in three jobs were state jobs at one point? Yeah. I could be, yeah. And then when the price of oil dropped, obviously that was um, a catastrophe for the country. Um, and, and that's not, we don't need to debate um, mm-hmm. his uh, authoritarian tendencies, but if he'd have approached that, differently to begin with rather than uh, uh using the wealth to create state jobs actually use that to inject to create a more capitalist society mm. do you think venezuela could be in a completely different place then yeah, yeah if they'd followed the norwegian model perhaps right yeah. where you treat this sort of uh largesse of the oil wealth as a um you know something that to, to help spread access but also you hold it in reserve you don't blow it all at once you use it as some uh know, buffer against the future so the norwegian sovereign uh sovereign wealth fund of course is very very well managed and that uses that however it's all it's very difficult to do that without having the right structures in place here's why bitcoin and oil are completely different right i mean you can't really build an oil wealth, an oil kind of uh, um, you know organizational structure, the infrastructure that you need to build that without the centralized power of something, whether it's a large corporation that then ends up like extracting all that rent for itself, or a government, which is the case of of, of Pemex, right? No, uh, what's it called? Blanking on the the Venezuelan. Uh, oh, uh, Pemex is the, is the Mexican one. Uh, anyway, you the, the you know, yep, the um, basically the the. Uh, the, the Venezuelan uh, state-owned oil company kind of almost had to be there. It could be, it could be, na- it could be privatized, but it's the same sort of thing, right? Mm. Because you need to spend a lot of money on that infrastructure. Where Bitcoin is is phenomenally different is like anybody can run a node, right? Anybody can run a miner. Now it's it's expensive to run miners, but if you're poor, you know you don't need to generate that much that, that much in the way of Bitcoin. And if you have enough of a kind of a collective structure around again decentralized microgrids that sort of pull all of that mining power, you can start to earn Sats that are there, and all of a sudden that centralized monopoly over the over the wealth creation, the extraction of the mining is no longer just in the hands of the government. It's something that can be can be pushed out and spread, right? So it's it's it, Venezuela could have maybe gone down the path of Norway, but it's you have to then reform government itself and do all these other things to make sure that the you distribute the wealth in the fairest and most sustainable way over the long term. Um, but you know, with Bitcoin, you have an opportunity to actually just, in fact, reimagine how the wealth itself is actually emerging in the first place, and um, that's where I think is really interesting. Um, but but yeah, I mean, we just the, the, the Venezuelan case is still a cautionary tale because mm. you could imagine the same problem emerging if you haven't enabled that more decentralized access to that wealth and you've just centralized uh, the control and say the, the geothermal volcano that everybody's excited about. Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting to talk about though because essentially you're talking about, in the same voice, you're talking about Bitcoin and social programs. Mm-hmm. And many Bitcoiners are anti any form of social program. Any, you know, a lot of them anti any form of redistribution of income, anti government. So it's quite a 
it's quite a radical concept in in the Bitcoin world. I'm not anti it, by the way. Um, mm. You know, I, I'm whatever my belief on government is. Should it be smaller? Should we have it? It doesn't really matter. But whilst we have it, um, and whilst we have governments, we do have taxation. We do have redistribu- redistribution of income. So to have this based on Bitcoin is a unique concept because we don't have any other other government in the world who has treated yeah. Bitcoin like legal tender. It's not going to be in any other government's coffers the way it is with uh, El Salvador right now. So, and we know Bukele has said that everyone who has the uh, Chivo wallet, I think it's th- they getting thirty dollars of Bitcoin as a kickstart, but that's really a kickstart. And every yeah, yeah. they could all just yeah. go and sell that immediately and not hold on to it. Mm. I, th- I I I see what you're recognizing is that this could create a new wealth divide in the country. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, and and yeah, it is a unfortunately this intersection between the reality of the moment, right? That we have mm-hmm. centralized nation state government controls. Um, you know, Bitcoiners who who are all you know anarchists and libertarians are so excited about the fact that this is being resolved by a centralized government that's making these rules, right? I, I think this is part of the, the challenge. And, and it's not to say it's not a good thing. I think the idea of legal tender um, and the, 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 the possibility is huge. So, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, I think, look, it is just in my view, and I, and I know that a lot of your listeners are going to think differently, but just it's naive to think that any form of prosperity for the medium to long term can be created without some form of governance, right? It's the same, same issue. Like we've got mm-hmm. to figure this out uh, because you just, you, you know, what is your Bitcoin worth if you can't spend it on something that somebody else is going to create for you, right? I want to interact with others for the simple fact of economic activity. I can't buy the sun. I can't buy, you know, that, that but I do want to buy my food and I do want to buy my, my transport and all of the amenities that make myself happy. You know, do I need to act, interact with somebody. So let's just put that aside. You need to have a system for how we all work together to make that happen. Um, is that a decentralized governance system or is it is it centralized government? Put that aside. So, but it, but yeah, Bitcoin is now entering into that realm. I think it is because of that reality I just described, right, that just can't get away from the fact that we need governance and that there are existing nation states. We've got to figure out how, as this new model emerges, do, does that system work to the benefit of every allow the allow bitcoin to work to the benefit of everybody right i'm not talking about redistribution of wealth by the way not the way i see it maybe people would see it that way but i'm not saying hey take all your bitcoin and distribute it as some you know uh, nice large s some sort of chavez like model i'm saying no think about how you build the auto generating element of mining and attach it to the most important infrastructure we have, which is energy, and build systems that allow everybody else. So, you know, just the idea of a, 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 I built a project at MIT where we, we, we created a decentralized microgrid in, in Puerto Rico. Uh, we, we, we're working on how fo- out, outsiders can fund that through, you know, uh, essentially crypto uh, payments that are controlled by uh, these sort of smart, devices that then allow you to essentially you know collateralize your investment so it sort of decentralizes the ability to fund microgrids hopefully around the world and the 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 main thinking behind it was like if we gave people access to energy so it's just free And, and by the way the sun is free and so if everybody had access to energy and you had it in a community what interesting new entrepreneurial opportunities would emerge out of that? People would start to build electronic vehicle transport systems and somebody would have a taxi system built on that and they'd put up Wi-Fi towers so they could then, or they'd irrigate the farms, they'd use the pumps so that if you had you know, access to this, this network of systems and you had a, a mechanism for funding it and monetizing it uh, in this sort of decentralized way, what wonderful new you know, civilization building things could emerge out of that? So I'm not talking about saying, hey, here's, you know, $3,000 a month worth of Bitcoin, go and sit on your ass and do nothing. I'm saying, think hard about what it is that makes societies grow and entrepreneurship grow and, and everything else. And I think that you have in the intersection between, you know, solar microgrids, de- renewable energy and Bitcoin mining, um, a really powerful way to lay the framework for that kind of 
you know, essentially capitalist society. Although again, capitalism is a word that is a political word, right? I'm mm. talking about entrepreneurship and and opportunity and the pursuit of of, of prosperity and, and opportunity and, and happiness, right? So uh, anyway, yeah. I don't. I mean, I think I don't see that. I don't see that happening in the short term in. Than, um, in uh, El Salvador anyway. No, that's, but that's uh, because yeah. partly because the thinking is in the wrong place and this is what's frustrating. Mm. Look, I mean, the, the project that Square is doing with Blockstream is very interesting, right? They're trying to think this stuff through. Like, How would you build you know, a mechanism by which you could uh, have these? You know, Because of course, you need to have a lot of energy to generate you know, enough Bitcoin to, to be of any worth, which is why you know, these massive mining farms exist in places like Iceland and now on the edge of a volcano in, in El Salvador. But if you had a, a DAO-like structure that then like had, you know, say, I don't know, a thousand villages all participating as, as, as de facto owners of this, this shared microgrid, one could imagine in a place like Venezuela has got plenty of sun and you paired it with wind and everything else, that you could generate enough energy at a local decentralized level to this. By the way, one other thing about decentralized energy that I'm passionate about is like, you know, it, it is also a solution against the greatest vulnerability that we face uh, in terms of security, right? We saw the, the colonial pipeline shut down, forming 60, you know, 60 million people on the, in the U.S. eastern sub seaboard, suddenly vulnerable to a supposedly Russian hacker who just shut the thing down asking for Bitcoin. The problem is not the Bitcoin in that. The problem is the centralized control of the gasoline that you know is going down one pipeline. It is a central vector of attack, which people in the crypto world know exactly what that means. You distribute the the, the attack vector, and it suddenly is 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 not the same, right? So if you have all these redundancies, multiple microgrids everywhere with a certain amount of autonomy, but they're also interrelated with each other, now you have a much harder to break system. So again. Nobody are people thinking outside the box about this. They're saying, like, "Hey, we need renewable energy." That's 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 just part of the problem. It's not just oh, we need massive government investment in, in wind farms and and so forth. It is how do I actually build a truly decentralized architecture that is a more secure, sp- a, a, a more democratic in terms of access to it? Because the people who live in those places should have the rights to actually generate and, uh, their energy and 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 derive benefits from it and then build a payments and wealth generation mechanism on top of that so yes it, it's not what's going on in el salvador because we haven't got the right mindset for thinking about these things but there are people who are thinking about it I, you know I, i'm hoping that some of this kind of crazy elon musk versus you know jack dorsey and everything else stuff is is going to be generating some some more outside the box thinking on this stuff but one could imagine again imagine because it's not the reality a you know forward thinking visionary US government going into El Salvador and say, hey, look, this Bitcoin stuff seems crazy to us, but why don't you why don't we help you lay out this model? Because by the way, we want your people to be prosperous because we don't want them coming across the northern border, you know, and 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 that's how we can help out. Uh, that would be my dream. Unfortunately, a person who should be thinking like that, Elizabeth Warren, for example, oh. which is what triggered the tweet that, I, that we're talking about is completely in the wrong place about this because she doesn't get it, right? So, um, you know, the, the, the people who should care about the things I'm trying to talk about here, which is left-leaning people, people that, you know, m- my background, basically, uh, I just don't understand how this could be an incredible driver of opportunity. Uh, and so we're going down the path of, like, you know, black and white, good and evil, because we've got, you know, a centralized approach to it that is fundamentally out of touch with what we really should be thinking about. That's my concern with El Salvador. Yeah, it's definitely um, it's definitely a relevant topic for the US right now because when I was there, you know, I was in the waiting to meet the president the first time. There were people from US Aid there, and I was talking to them, and they were like, because I think they're wondering who this weirdo was with tattoos on his hands, and they're all in mm-hmm. suits, and they were asking me, and I was like, oh, you know, I'm a Bitcoin podcaster, I'm you know, telling them what I was doing, and they were fascinated by the idea of Bitcoin because uh, obviously it was a highly relevant time. The news had just been released, uh, and I was asking about the work they do, and they say we work on infrastructure projects. We want to help uh, El Salvador because we don't we want to re- reduce the number of people coming into the U.S. You know, it is a problem mm. for us. Um, mm. So it, it, 
it is on the radar. It's just, is it on the radar of the relevant people? Is uh, is politics getting in the way? I mean, you talked about Elizabeth Warren. Um, mm. Yeah, I, I think she said some interesting things in the past. Uh, I think she mm. tried to hold Mnuchin to account in a really good way. Um, I try to mm. look at all politicians objectively sometimes. Uh, I don't just dislike them all for the sake of it. But her rants against Bitcoin recently were, were really disappointed. It was... Um, showed a distinct lack of understanding and investment of her own time to understand what it is. But this is what we always have to deal with with Bitcoin. We know there's opportunities with Bitcoin to raise prosperity and create borderless payments and instant final settlement around the world with this amazing technology. But we see the amplification of all the same messages, uh, mm-hmm. terrorists and criminals and boiling the oceans and that that becomes a really difficult battle to fight it's almost exhausting and it was really interesting mm-hmm. listening to that word again to, by the way yeah that exhausting. word again you know because it, 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 it is part of the same problem it's it's the mechanism of control over the the channels of information that are that, that are allowing this kind of misinformation or this this alternative narrative to to take charge yeah i was listening to um michael Saylor with M- M- marty bent recently uh mm-hmm. i don't know if you listen to them two together uh, I was, certainly not the two of you. I listened to both of them at different times, but didn't hear that episode. No. Well, so it's a really interesting one because I think they both were brilliant in it, and whilst they were both brilliant in it, they they also at some points talked past each other. Um, but what I was realizing that Michael Saylor was doing, which, which is really good, and some people would disagree, but there is this whole Bitcoin toxicity, and I understand toxicity around the protocol not allowing people to come in and fuck with the protocol because that's really important. You know, Bitcoin is stable. Mm-hmm. It is where it's come from over the last 12 years and especially since the the scaling wars is is it's truly incredible. Um and I understand that but that this bleed of toxicity into any form of belief you have around government covid <laughs> uh, global warming is I think it sometimes goes too far. And I'm watching Michael Saylor and I'm listening to him. And actually, what he's trying to do is be a PR machine for Bitcoin. He's trying to work on getting good and helpful messages out. And you know what? What, One of the really interesting things is since the Mining Council has come together, and I was very critical, is that I've seen some press articles recently that aren't so negative. Some are neutral, Mm -hmm. and I read a positive one the other day. Mm -hmm. Um, Actually, the, the positive one I read was, release of the information that comes from Cambridge, what's that, whoever they are. Uh, the, um, the Cambridge Centre for Alternative Inve- uh, that's it. Investment. Alternative Money, Alternative Something. Yes, I know the one. Yeah, but anyway, at Cambridge it's, University. It's about, it's about being a bit more smart with the messaging. It's, it's a, you know, because if anyone's critical of Bitcoin on Twitter, you just go into, you just go into the replies. It's like all the Bitcoin is like, fuck you, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Mm. And then occasionally you have somebody with a more articulate, answer or, or a more considered answer and and so i've been it's another issue i've been wrestling with this idea of like where should you be you know blunt i don't like the toxic term i've used it myself but you know what is the messaging do we need to be more mature with the messaging like bitcoin now is a global asset that it has liquidity liquidity in every country in the world it has a country that's made it legal tender it has companies have it on its balance sheet it's not going away we're mm-hmm. beyond the point of banning Bitcoin. Yes, they might try and regulate it heavily. So, you know, self-critical, personally, I'm thinking, do we need to be much smarter with the messaging now? Well, I, I would definitely say yes. Um, uh, but the question is how? How do, how do you institute that, right? It is truly, by definition, a decentralized organization. So, um, and it gets back to what we talked about at the very beginning. Like, we are all, whether we like it or not, inside this matrix. When you and I go on crypto Twitter... Our brains are being manipulated, right? Not just, you know by the algorithm, by each other. Uh, we're looking for triggers. The, the Twitter, the, the crypto Twitter troll is an in, is a beast that we know very very well. It is yeah. all about the trigger. It's all about the response and so forth, right? That is not just a thing that affects our daily life. It is a business model. It is how Facebook makes its money. It's why the whole debate over Cambridge Analytica and and you know the manipulation of the Brexit vote. It's because our brains get triggered. Our brains get triggered. Our brains get triggered. That is like when, uh, you know, Oliver Luck and I wrote this book, The Social Organism. The thing that I thought was really fascinating about this concept was like the old infrastructure of information was uh, the power over the control of information was centralized because it was expensive to build 
you know, the distribution cable lines, for example, or the printing presses. And so to actually control this bit of information, it was, it was expensive, and that's why you had these, these controllers. Then we broke it all down. We flattened it, and we gave everybody access. But we still had to figure out how, do we distrib- how does the power, what are the forces by which the power over the control of information come to bear in this environment? It's about emotions, right? The, mm-hmm. the connectivity of our, of our system, now the distribution system is actually emotions. If, if people are going to be, you know, going to share this podcast with everybody, it's because something you or I said triggered people to go, oh, I'm going to share that. So, and that becomes the actual distribution mechanism. So, so follows and shares and likes and so forth is distribution. So ultimately, if you're thinking as a capitalist, like, oh my God, how do I control that, right? How do I get the control over that process? Algorithmic control is, is, is all about like, so I'm sorry, I'm going on a tangent here, no, but it's do relevant it, do it. to how we, get, how we get back to Bitcoin toxicity. Because, um, you know, essentially what Facebook created was this concept of like audiences. And uh, it, it's powerful for, for, for advertisers to know that um, there's a bunch of people who all agree on the same thing, who are completely passionate about it, who are going to reshare and like and engage with each other because they're a sticky audience. So... Essentially, Facebook sort of like, okay, I'm going to create an algorithm that makes sure that everybody who's a hardline conservative is all inside this group. And everybody who's a, you know, really passionate liberal lefty is all in that group. And what I'm going to do is like feed them a, a, a select feed of stuff. And I'm not going to give them this, I'm going to give them that, right? And ultimately, what you've got is a reinforcing loop that is creating echo chambers, it's creating groupthink, but it's creating a wonderful environment for advertisers because they know that this is a targetable niche audience. And that means that Facebook advertising is, is, is worth a premium relative to the advertising that goes on you know, an institution. Like, you know, everyone in, in Bitcoin slams the main, mainstream press, but the, but the reality is most you know, sensible, prof- I came up in this profession, professional news organizations are trying to be balanced. They're trying to be actually open to everybody. Um, you know, albeit within the old, you know, Walter Cronkite centralized structure and the, in the narrow Overton window, they are nonetheless saying, hey, how do we be balanced and fair? And, you know, advertisers are like, oh, that's all great, but you know what? You don't get the same stickiness that if you, if you have these things. So there's a, a great story about these Macedonian kids in 2016 who created a website that was, that was making up stories and were feeding them this is, uh, into a particular Facebook group that they knew, or actually, actually a bunch of Facebook groups, that they knew because these stories were going to resonate with conservative voters, would get reshared and everything else, and that all these Google Sense dollars would flow back to them. So Facebook had created this architecture mm. for its own advertising and these kids were making up lies. And the thing that got me about it as a journalist for years was like, holy shit, you know, for years we've been struggling to get more pay uh, and we've had to share the money around because of the expense of having lawyers and infrastructure and sending people out to, to cover wars and you name it. It's an expensive business being a news organization. And these kids in Macedonia can just make up bullshit like, you know, uh, Obama's birth certificate found in Kenya and 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 it, they know it's going to get shared and they're going to get more advertising dollars going towards them because of this, the business model that Facebook has created. This is the fucking problem. And so we're all, whether we like it or not, even in the Bitcoin community, prone to this. We can't, we don't understand. It's subtle because it's everywhere. You were talking about being on crypto Twitter all the time and having to take off your phone. We're all part of this, right? So what we need is awareness of that, awareness of our own limitations, our own constraints, and the fact that there is a system. It is the matrix. How, it, it's, it's, it's red, blue, blue, blue pill stuff, right? And when we see that, we can start to tackle the toxicity because it's literally in how we respond. I, I, I like your point about toxicity in the protocol. I think that's, that's an interesting way to think about it. But, but, but let's remove the word toxicity and say, no, let's take a hardline position that we defend yeah. the protocol. Not that we play games and troll each other and everything else because yes it looks immature you know it, it, it we need the rest of the world to buy into this i, I mean i believe like i mean you know again certain bitcoin, bitcoin maxis are just happy sitting on their bags and thinking they're going to get rich forever i'm interested in this because i think it's going to change the world and if that's the case we need to convince everybody of that so you know the those of us who have a voice in this space um, who, who, you know, yourself, myself, you know, Marty Bent, people like this who really are out there and have a chance to change it, change things. They need to be just aware of the fact that the toxicity does not help. And by the way, that toxicity 
you have no control over it. It's being dictated by this goddamn algorithm and all of the the, the, the sort of the, the structures that that exist within our own emotional responses. So, I I don't know. I I think an open mind, uh, a, a a sort of a generous. Uh, my, my boss is you know uses this word generous listening within CoinDesk, and you know uh, this is a. These these are traits that actually allow for a healthier discourse to emerge, and I think that that will serve the community far better than allowing ourselves to be controlled by the matrix. Yeah, it's uh, I go through cycles of this. I'd love to have my my producer Danny on talk about this because the amount of times I have a conversation with him, say I'm just not using Twitter in the right way. I'm just not. I'm trolling or I'm fucking around or I'm being a dick. Maybe I should turn my Twitter off, or maybe you should control my Twitter. And if I'm going to send a tweet, I send it to you first, and you'd like to say, <laughs> "Don't send that, Pete," because there is that like mix of it's so much fun. For, firstly, yeah, with also realizing that there's something really important going on here with Bitcoin. There's something, like as you say, it's like it's a technology that can do so much for the world, um, break down a lot of barriers. It can help people in different parts of the world. Yeah, you know, it's way more helpful to someone in El Salvador than it is to you or I. Um, mm-hmm. so I do feel this sense of responsibility and I also feel like I am constrained, not just by the algorithm, but my own, um, what's the best word? I'll say courage. It's, it sounds a little bit, mm-hmm. bra- you yeah, know, a bit of a bravado, but like the own courage to say, look, I disagree with you here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sometimes right. I like for, I'll give you a couple of examples. For, so firstly, I am not an anarchist and I'm not a libertarian. I like a lot of the ideas. I think it sounds brilliant. Mm-hmm. And I think if they can influence governance, I think that's great. But I'm just not there yet. But sometimes I feel like, shit, I, I, I just have to act a bit like an anarchist because otherwise I just get shouted out, called a cock and an idiot and all that kind of stuff. That's one of the things. And also uh, being like the, the toxic maximalist. Uh, again, I feel like sometimes I have to do that. But I, I also then come back and think, why am I doing this? Like, what value is this adding? What value is this adding to Bitcoin? Are we all just like wasting our time? Because I did the interview with uh, Eric Weinstein and it, it, it was one of my worst because I prepared badly for it. But a few things that he stuck in my mind, the, the one thing that really stuck with me, what he said is like, uh, you guys created, like, I'm, I'm not, I won't get the words correct. You created this amazing thing. I really believed in Bitcoiners. Yeah. All I see is like Lambo and Moon. It's like, what are you guys doing? Like, mm. what are you doing? Like, <laughs> let's, not, let's not fucking around. Let's do so. And that's, that is another thing that's really stuck with me is that I, 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 I wonder sometimes as Bitcoiners, if we sometimes get lost, we get too defensive. Uh, we have to have a, a defense for every argument against Bitcoin. And then we have to shout at people. Whereas actually, should we, can we be more constructive about the important issues? Yes. Hard line on the protocol. Great. Yeah, let's keep the block small. Let's have a fixed monetary policy. It has worked. We've been 12 years in, hasn't had to change its monetary policy once, whereas Ethereum has multiple times. But can we can we have a better dialogue around Bitcoin? Can we be more inclusive in that dialogue and inviting people in? Do we really need to spend all day, every day shouting other protocols? Like I think most of it's bullshit, but is it just a waste of time? People want to, you know, does is that a distraction from Bitcoin? And these are all things I've wrestled, and I've wrestled with them. Every six months, I wrestle with them again. And I think you're right in terms of the so, the social media platforms because I think that's what's driving me to not act like myself. So I'll meet somebody. I'll go to Miami, the conference, and I'll hang out with somebody. And they're like, oh, you're not like you are on Twitter. Well, your podcast is different. And I think Twitter, certainly Twitter, makes me act like somebody I'm not. Mm-hmm. Which is a problem. Well, what's, which is the whole well, point it, it is. And you're actually really you're hitting on some really key points here. And what's also interesting, by the way, is look at this medium that we have, right? This podcast mm. medium. Uh, it's a completely different forum. And you sit back and you listen and we and we engage. And you're being self-reflective, which is really impressive. And by the way, that's, I think, part of your appeal, part of your brand, which I, it isn't a bad word. Brand is not a bad word at all. It's, it's mm-hmm. a mechanism by which people are relating to you. Uh, and you can only do this in this particular medium because podcasting allows us to do it. So it, it's a completely different set of dopamine releases, right? And that's let the me, dopamine releases. That is the let me just point, jump but, in and yeah. in, in, just interrupt you on that point, which is why I think... <laughs> Clubhouse, for all its faults, mm. and now Twitter Spaces are actually a great tool. Great. They're actually they actually level up uh, social media uh, because it's so much harder to say "fuck you, you cuck, mm-hmm. you bullshit, 
all that stuff that people say when they're typing, so much harder to say that with actual yeah. words. They do, but I actually find the discourse in yeah. Clubhouse and in uh, Twitter Spaces, I find it much better than a than a tw- Twitter conversation. Yeah, absolutely. You're right, but there's there's a there's another aspect of the of the Twitter economy, which is the, you know the key point here that that is challenging, and that is that. Um, yeah, our control over our, I mean, can we recognize that, I, 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 okay, there's a dopamine hit that I'm going to ha- have if I respond to this and sort of say something. I need to control that. But but in reality, it's also a business model because the more likes and follows you get, which come from the actual building that that fi- self-feeding, by the way, viral concept, which is what we're talking about, the social organism, viral concept of retweets and so forth is all dopamine releases, all built into a big mushrooming ecosystem. It breeds power because you know you've got a lot of Twitter followers, and you you know. And, and by the way, just this is going to be a way to, to think about this. So too is a is a gentleman that I know that you've been sparring with a lot on on Twitter, who has many many more followers, Elon Musk. And we sit there and we go, oh, isn't this terrible? Bitcoin's being hijacked by this one guy who has all this control. That's horrible. We have to stop him. So let's yell at him. Right, and all we're doing is the two of us, he and us, feeding the same model. So the Peter yeah. McCormick's and the and and the and the and the Elon Musk's are really, whether they agree with it or not, or even realize it, are building up their own followerships around a model that is inherently feeding off this horrible. Like it's 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 going nowhere. Like it's just a bouncing around. No one's resolving anything. Whereas, um, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right in terms of Clubhouse and things. We don't have the the payoff is not the same, right? The payoff is is different and and so we are going to be more restrained there are there's 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 a whole lot of social norms around that which is another form of governance as i mentioned before right that exist in this spoken environment and and i think that's yeah potentially really constructive again it it comes down to being just aware and aware not Mm -hmm. of our own failings our own limits as like dopamine is something that uh, you know, it was 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 as an element of survival that we've evolved to have, but it's become it's it's about our fight and flight response. But in this entirely, almost entirely online world we live now, where it's just our ideas spinning around in our heads, it's completely dysfunctioning. It's functioning as if we're running away from you know an attack by a pack of by by a pride of lions, but we're actually really not. We're we're feeling like we're attacked by Elon Musk or by Peter McCormick or who, mm. whichever side of the fence we're on in this, right? So, I mean. It's and it's like a drug addiction as well. So it as somebody is. It's, ha- that's what drug addiction. It's, it's it, they're completely related. It is about addiction, right? You know? And and I think, um, yeah. Let's let's not just yeah. Let's think personally how we deal with that, but also recognize that the very business model of social media is you know. And and, and actually, Jack Dorsey is really interesting on this because I think he he get he gets it. He does. And he feels as if and, you know. And his and, and the whole deep platform. There's a whole other part of this, right? But it's again about the central control over these massive distribution networks that are run on dopamine systems, All right? Then you have to make decisions because they have real power. And you think, oh my God, COVID misinformation, da da da, what am I going to do? Only solution is to is to actually be a censor, which is not what they want to do at all, right? So then you mm-hmm. shut down Trump or you shut down whomever. And we're all upset about that, rightly so, because we recognize these platforms have got too much power. But at the end of the day, you're like, well, what are you going to do about it? Right. So they wanted to do about it is think about the model of social media. Let's think about how we would build a system both from our personal level, but also I would argue legislation, like break these things up, create create utility type structures around it web 3.0 may be a way through this right there's a whole lot of different ways to think about that but i mean we've gone on a, a different tangent but at the end of the day but it's I important think, oh yeah because it, it, i think awareness of all of that then helps us think through this toxic toxicity issue um and how we can be constructive around it. i think you know el salvador is a perfect opportunity for the community to step back and go, all right, how do we want this to work, right? This is an opportunity. Like, it could go either way. It truly could, right? You could, if if ultimately the World Bank, as we've already seen, and the US government, everybody else, responds to this because I think, oh my God, you know, Bukele has been captured by a bunch of crazy Bitcoiners who are all drug addicts and, and you know, arms dealers and, and whatevers, because that narrative ends up being dominated by whomever is controlling the vehicles of, of information on this, then there'll be, a backlash from Bukele's part, and yes, he'll probably end up becoming more corrupt and the whole thing will become even more centralized and it won't really be what we want it to be. Whereas if we're able to allow the Bitcoin you know, experiment in, in El Salvador th- flourish in an environment in which everybody is talking about it in a constructive way and these terrified incumbent institutions like the World Bank start going, all right, yeah, maybe we can work with this, right? I actually know the 
the people who ran the blockchain unit at the World Bank, and they don't think like this, right? They'd be really constructive around this. You could imagine a very different conversation going on. So it all comes back to the same thing. We've got to be, we've got to recognize the capacity that for, for our own behavior, as those of us who have these megaphones, to influence how these other powerful people make decisions about what's going to happen in places like El Salvador. So, yeah, it's very, very important. It's a big challenge, though. I mean, yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's no there's one telling. There's no one telling us what to do, right? It has to come from within. In, in yeah, Germany. it's it's a bit like um, U.S. interference in other countries. People say no, the revolution has to come from within. It's, you're looking at what happens with Cuba now, and Biden talking about further sanctions. You think, well, does that help? Does that hinder? I, yeah, I mean, I think it hinders. hinders. I it, think it it's hinders. proven to have hindered for the last. I covered. I know quite a bit about Cuba because I said I wrote a book about Che and spent quite a bit of time there. Yeah. And absolutely, the, the the trade embargo has done nothing but burnish the Castro regime's, uh, you know, representation of what they're doing. It, 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 power comes from storytelling again, and and and, it, and in fact, Cuba in that sense was was revolutionary. They understood the power of memes, right? Like Che mm-hmm. is a meme. Uh, 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 you know, the Bonavista Social Club, all this stuff that they did in the 90s when they realized that they had to rebrand Cuba as kind of chic revolutionary. You know, this was all ahead of its time, but it was all in the service of protecting an existing corrupt socialist system. And so the, the trade embargo was perfect. Oh, look, big bad guy over there. What a story to tell, right? It's not our fault that you don't have any food on your table. It's that it's Uncle Sam over there. And all over Cuba, there's all this imagery with um, Uncle Sam being the bad guy. And it, like, yeah, it, it's, it's been perfect for the narrative uh, in Cuba. And so, yeah, we have to think hard about how, like, policies and, and 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 positions again why elizabeth warren is extremely frustrating right now because she could she's just feeding in you know these these, these false narratives around um you know what what could be possible and what's not but it's re, it's the rebuilding of these platforms if it is rebuilding restructuring that's what i don't understand because we've had newer platforms we've had masterdom yeah. come in and it's interesting and it gets some usage usage but people giving up their large followings on one platform to move to another is really no, no, difficult. No. So that's yeah, yeah, really yeah. difficult. So how do you get it from within Twitter? Like I believe in Jack Dorsey and I know he has his critics. I don't believe he is the guy sitting there banning people, et cetera. Um, and I believe a lot of the decisions come from internally. But, you know, I don't know any of this, but I, I, my assumption is there's teams internally are making decisions. He can't make every decision running uh, multiple companies. Right. But I believe he recognizes the problem. Mm-hmm. And I believe he wants a solution to this. Uh, I think mm-hmm. ultimately he's, he has a, a v- very good heart, but I don't know the solution. I don't know. I know my personal solution is to mm-hmm. stop being a dick, mm-hmm. stop getting into these fights and try and be constructive, have good constructive conversations. Uh, I think the best person I see for doing this is, is Joe Rogan. And that's such an obvious thing to say, but he does. He doesn't look at the comments on Twitter he engages with conversations with people in an honest way, and he won't generally. Let's say just generally, because you know some of the shows are now missing. But he generally won't self censor. He has recognised the responsibility of his platform. You know, having someone like Alex Jones on, he did try to fact check him, which wasn't done in the best way possible. But like somebody mm. like him has a lot enough self awareness to do things in the right way, and maybe that's because he's in such a, uh, a a good position. But. I think it, a lot of this does come from within, but how mm. do we re- remove the reward structure, the dopamine uh, hit? Because it is powerful. It is like a drug addiction. It's funny. It's like a drug addiction in, in many ways. As I said, like I'm a former addict. You, 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 as well as getting the dopamine hit, you get the, the depression afterwards and the guilt and the, the shame. Mm. And <laughs> that's all part of the same thing. So look, I, I don't know the answer. That's my problem. And, that's, well, I mean, it, 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 it's very hard because it is a structural thing, right? Because just because you solve it for you doesn't mean the other, mm. you know, have many billion people on Twitter and Facebook have, have, have also solved it. So, you know, yes, right now, given what we've got, this is where it has to be. But no, we have to think about, this, about the, the business models and, and how, like, the thing about, again, we, we have governments and, they, and, they, and they're supposed to create rules around which capitalism can thrive. And some of that, right, Teddy Roosevelt was, you know, the, 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 the antitrust guy. He realized that you should break down monopolies. Um, what, what we then built was this whole, like, oh, don't touch 
you know, private business because that's, you know, even though with the, these antitrust laws were in place and they, they survived and served America well, any notion that we could apply those laws to, say, Facebook or, or Twitter is like, oh, but that's, that's unreasonable because, you know, you're, you're breaking down free enterprise, you're attacking, you know, businesses. And by the way, the products they're giving us to us are wonderful and free. So, so, so shut up. It's like, you know, the, the idea behind monopolies and fighting them was that they would have a monopoly power over the price setting function. And so people think, well, you know, Facebook's free, Twitter's free. It's not, of course, right? It, you, and, and it's it's Bruce Schneier's, you are not Facebook's customer, you are Facebook's product that tells us that because we are giving these platforms our data every day, which they then turn back onto us. Again, read Shushana Zuboff's uh, uh, surveillance capitalism book. Yeah. They take that, they repurpose it into a mind control system that then, you know, they make money from by creating this business model. So we have to understand that it's not free, that in fact, they've got more power than any monopoly has ever had. And we are paying for that every single day with the data and contributions and content that we make to that thing, right? So that's the first thing. Then do you make, what do you do about that? Okay, so maybe breaking them up as a trust isn't the best thing because that's all really heavy handed and so forth. But how do we invest, for example, in different systems? You made a really good point. Like there's this existing uh, uh, network effect, right? Everybody's on Twitter, so everybody's on Twitter. You go create a smaller alternative, I'm not going to go there because everybody's on Twitter. How do we build a system by which I can take my content, my data, my, as the creator, the person who, and you and I in this business of making money from content, how do I take that and now basically spread it across different platforms, aggregate that information, take data, and, and now I'm in control, not somebody else, right? I'm, I'm doing a bit of a pitch here because I formed a company. It's amazing I haven't even got around to pitching it until now. But I founded a company before I uh, started. went to Coindesk called, called Streambed Media, which, which is, is the heart and soul of what we're trying to do, is how do we build data systems that run across these things independently as a platform so that creators now get control, right? That's one piece of it. Um, you know, Web 3.0 ideas, which is, I know you're not an Ethereum believer, but it came out of Ethereum and now, you know, it's, it's, it's guys like Gavin Wood who are, broken from Ethereum, but, but you know, working on the Polkadot protocol and things like that, that are trying to think through how does the structure of the web change when you've now got, it's the, the, the very um, starting point for interaction with it. It is not crawled, controlled by ISPs. It's not controlled by these, these you know, internet platforms, but I, as the individual, am now interacting with this stuff. Um, and, and, and that's the vision of the internet that was supposed to have emerged when it was created, and, and that's where we need it to go. So a lot of it comes down to, you know, what was allowed to happen before blockchain emerged in the world, and uh, we had to sort of put commerce onto the internet, and so we built business models around advertising and power. We've got to figure out how the business model, like, like no one's saying socialism no one's saying you know uh let's let's have centralized control of information that's the worst thing imaginable we just talked about cuba but how mm -hmm. do we build a platform a framework right this is what government should do how do you build the structural thing how do you think like teddy teddy roosevelt and go okay what can i do in terms of a legal political framework so that a truly entrepreneurial free enterprise system can thrive in a way that actually benefits society in the interests of continued prosperity and that's what the internet is not doing now because of these platforms and all the stuff we just talked about we've got to think like that and and it's not easy it is ex very very difficult but there are ideas you know that that, that you know you you as I say, I think I think I tend to be interested in Bitcoin as much because I see the protocol as a system for governance, and therefore I've always been interested in Ethereum and all these other things that could 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 emerge out of that. Because it, even if it doesn't have the exact answers, it makes us think about what a different decentralized framework for all this stuff could allow us to do in a way that wasn't so harmful. Yeah, so it's what it takes me back to that point about Weinstein. What the fuck mm. are we doing? And and I. And, and, Sorry, it's Weinstein, and I, I know not everyone likes him, but I, I do. I like the guy. He's an I like the way guy. He, he's extremely yeah. intelligent. Yeah, I don't agree with everything. Uh, I don't think mm -hmm. he's always great at explaining himself, but I do think he he has some really interesting ideas around. Well, firstly, the breakdown of institutions, uh, mm -hmm. including academia, but most importantly, just that question: What the fuck are we doing here? And I do keep <laughs> thinking about it. And it's right, Bitcoiners. They have a lot of wealth. They have mm -hmm. power. They have the ability to do things. And what are the things that that they can do? What are the contributions they can make to make Bitcoin not look like the big scary monster it seems to from those on the outside? 
actually, what can it do for financial inclusion? What can it do? How can we help solve uh, uh, the, the issues of global warming, which I know, amazingly, some people don't still actually believe is uh, caused <laughs> by humans, which I find mm-hmm. which, amazing. Which, which is a function of all that disinformation and you know everything else, right, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Group uh, think, yeah migration issues like i think bitcoiners can come together they're smart people they've got powerful people around them now uh, jack dorsey elon mm-hmm. musk as you said yeah p- perhaps there is a better way to engage and all come together to build better structures better systems so so yeah i mean i think you're right uh el salvador is an interesting project it's this entire conversation has made me rethink the el salvador project it's made me rethink not that I have an answer, that I have to go away and think about, because what I thought El Salvador was is now very different having had this conversation. Mm, okay. But I well, don't you know, know, the, and, I, I don't and, know why. And, by the way, and I don't have all the answers either, right? It, it's just, you know, and, and, and all we're doing, this is what's interesting about this type of dialogue and why podcasting is so good. It's like, it's, it's just somebody's ideas now being allowed to be introduced into the conversation and yeah. our own, you know, and, and, and the freedom to go, you know what, that's made me think a little differently, right? And, and, and obviously, it's what I get from listening to you a lot. And, you know, it, it's, it's been, like, you know, I would never have been able to uh, make the leap into Bitcoin as a guy who was writing about Wall Street for the Wall Street Journal and had that whole framework built around that if it weren't for a couple of things. One was the fact that I'd lived in Argentina where I got an understanding of, of money truly how dysfunctional <laughs> money can be yeah and i've said this before like you know you you understand money you can understand money and you can understand systems when you see how it doesn't work right that's when you understand how it does work and you realize that how, how it does work is completely fucked up so um so that was the starting point but then that was like i you know i i think you know as a journalist was trained to like have a little bit of an open mind and was taken out for dinner by a bunch of you know fairly wealthy entrepreneurs uh, when I wrote a pretty bad column about about Bitcoin in 2013, I said, you know, we'll take you out for dinner with a bunch of other journalists and we'll tell you about this. And my mind just went, because I had that, I think, at that late, that moment in my life, open mind to do it. So I was able to cross the chasm and sort of embrace mm. an entirely different way of thinking about things, right? So every Bitcoiner has gone through that process because they, you know, you know, most of least, some of them are kind of born, I suppose, anarchists, but there's so many people who have gone, oh, wow. You know, and the, the, by the way, the, the most enjoyable thing I ever hear from people um, is that, you know, my book helped them make that leap, right? Because it's, 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 Mm -hmm. there's nothing, no greater reward than you've allowed people to actually go, oh, wow. Um, But every one of us has made that leap, right? And we need to be open to letting others do the same. Um, And we also have to be open to like adjusting our own mindset about other, other perspectives, right? And, and, I think if you do that, it's a, just a much healthier opportunity for progress. So I, 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 again, this is a great conversation because it allows us to be this way. And, and I don't know, uh, you know, Peter, you know, it, it, the, the, the appealing part of it is this sort of the self-examination aspect of it. And I think it's, yeah. it's really constructive. Yeah. Well, it can't it just come at the right time because I am self, I'm always self-examining. I'm always like rethinking my own models. Well, health own issues behavior. will do that to you. Well, yeah, there is that, and age does it to you, and parenting does it to you, and the examples you set, like <laughs> like when a when your child turns around to you and says, "Dad, why are you doing that?" <laughs> you're like, yeah, like, why what? am I doing that? Why am I, why am I doing that? And if you were doing it, what would I say to you? And it's uh, yeah, there's a lot of self reflection right now, and you know, considering like next phase of life, because you go through those phases, right? I'm, I'm about to, I'm within. We're now in months with one of my children becoming a fully fledged adult, like mm. perhaps leaving home, and mm. that's making me rethink certain things. But, but definitely in, in the world of Bitcoin, I'm like very conscious that there is this a platform, and a lot of people listen to it, and and it's very easy to pick shows based on downloads. But there's also important to pick shows based on what the content is, the topic is, and yeah, yeah, I'm I'm wrestling with a few things at the moment, and. It's one of these ones I can't give an answer to, but it's mm. it's one of these things I'm going to go away. I'm going to sit down with my producers and say, you know what, I think we need to think rethink our content at the moment. And you know, there's some there's some interesting topics we can be approaching. You know, mm. We can be challenging some ideas. So this was really useful I, I, for me. Well, thank you. I, I, totally for me too. I, it's also just been great to see this this way of approaching a podcast um and a reflective aspect of it and you know and i I hope your listeners get something out of that very act itself right well the listeners the listeners are very different from twitter that is one Mm -hmm. thing 
that's why I've sometimes like I'm in a fortunate position, but that's why sometimes I've not been afraid also to just go on my own path um, because I get a lot of people write to me. I don't know who they are. They're, they're not on Twitter and they, they tell me things. They say, I don't want to say this on Twitter because I don't want to get yelled at, yada, yada. So they, they're a lot of the driver of the kind of some of the decisions I make as well. Uh, and I think they'll love this conversation. I think this will be very popular. Uh, I wish we could have done it in person. <laughs> Mm, with a few whiskeys yeah, but you know yeah exactly well it'll yeah. someday we'll get there Jeez. well i'll be back over hopefully subject to mm-hmm. not having coronavirus and being mm-hmm. able to get in the u.s i'll be back in the u.s i'm going to be in new york in um september time anyway at the salt oh. conference so if you're around oh. then uh, we should yeah, probably catch up might, might even be there at the salt conference i think there's some talk about going there good well, stuff then we have All no right. excuse man listen tell absolutely. people about the, about the books where they can find them where they can find you yeah absolutely so you know uh coindesk.com obviously for coindesk stuff um you can the, the book is the, the two books of relevance probably to the bitcoin crowd at least is the age of cryptocurrency and um uh, the truth machine but yeah my, my personal website which needs desperately needs to be upgraded michaeljcasey.com has a bunch of details on that i do need to make the final plug streambed media uh wish i'd said that earlier uh i'm the chairman of that but my uh you know co-founder jenna pilgrim is doing an incredible job building um uh what we're calling a rights oracle for the nft industry which i think is going to be really important for how we do rights management some of this stuff we were talking before about uh that streambedmedia.com um yeah, those are the those are the best places. You know, as I said, newsletter is called Money Reimagined, comes out on a Friday, um, and the podcast um, is also out under the same name with Sheila Warren, Money Reimagined. Well, we will stick all of that in the show notes, man. And listen, hopefully, I will see you in New York in a couple of months. Yeah, mate, it's going to be great. All right, all right, good Appreciate stuff. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. See you then. 